When Korea was initially divided in 1945, the division was seen only as a temporary solution. But fast forward to the present day, and North and South Korea remain very much divided, each entity with its distinct political, economic, and social systems. The division isn't the only thing that still stands, so does the hope of reunification. But is this reunification even possible? And if so, what would a reunified Korea even look like? In one corner you have the democratic and vibrant South Korea, whose capital, Seoul, stands as a global economic powerhouse, a tech hub, and a cultural trendsetter that can wow you with its pop art city lights and modern skyscrapers. In the other corner, however, things are a bit more gray, and we mean that literally. Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, is all about brutalist grayness and architectural uniformity, which is pretty much on par with the country's overall ethos of strict control and conformity. But things aren't only gray aesthetically. North Korea has always been shrouded in political secrecy, with its totalitarian regime keeping the country tightly controlled and isolated. Talk about a tale of two worlds. Plus, let's not forget North and South Korea are technically still at war. That's right, an armistice might have been signed in 1953 to end hostilities, but the Korean War never saw a formal peace treaty. All of this is probably enough for an outside observer to conclude that the schism between the modern and democratic South and its retrogressive and oppressive North seems indelible. But what do the North and South in question have to say about this? You probably won't be surprised to hear that opinions here are mixed, though of course we get most of these opinions from the South, as the North isn't particularly forthcoming with anything really, let alone internal affairs. But it is undeniable that a peculiar longing for unification lingers between the Koreas, transcending borders and generations. After all, the two countries are inexorably linked by a shared history and common heritage. South Koreans are still taught that North Koreans are their people, a part of their country. However, they're also taught that North Korea's government is the enemy and warned about appearing too sympathetic to the North, which can actually be viewed as a violation of South Korea's National Security Act. No wonder some referred to Korea as the Peninsula of Paradoxes. From what little we know about the North, we can safely say North Korea is pro-unification, but of course only on its own terms. The leadership of the two countries is also engaged in this will-they-won't-they -they game for quite a while now. Former South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un famously met in 2018. They discussed the possibility of denuclearization and improved relations while eating a mango mousse with a map of the United Peninsula and sitting on chairs featuring the same motif. But then again, North Korea did call the current South Korean president Yoon suk yeol a guy with a trash-like brain and a diplomatic idiot, following his 2023 UN speech in which he warned that South Korea won't sit idly by as North Korea and Russia potentially agree on a weapons deal. So you probably see why the issue of Korean unification is anything but straightforward. And by now, clearly, we won't find any definitive answers to our questions in the Koreas. So what do the experts say? Well, most experts believe a German-style reunification is the only possible scenario for a unified Korea. If you aren't familiar with the German history, let us break it down for you. When talking about German reunification, we're talking about the merging of the Federal Republic of Germany, often referred to as West Germany, and the German Democratic Republic, colloquially known as East Germany. This historic event took place in 1990, symbolizing the end of the Cold War division. Though symbolizing is the key word here, the Cold War has left us with many relics, one of which is the very division we're discussing in this video. But back to Germany. The German reunification scenario is quoted as the only possible model for Korean reunification as it involved merging a communist society and a planned economy with a democratic society and a market economy. This merger was primarily based on close integration with the global economy and notable success in exporting manufacturers. However, it's important to note that the German reunification started with no clearly laid out plan, which is surprising on its own but becomes downright shocking considering how much Germany relishes organization. Perhaps this absence of a roadmap is also the reason why some experts consider this reunification of Germany to be unfinished and even unsuccessful. The latter argue that the significant economic boost of the former East Germany only came at a cost of social enemy, with the residents of the East believing that they were treated and still are treated as second-class citizens. So, if a Korean reunification was to happen following a similar model, a question arises. Would North Koreans become second-class citizens? After all, they are the ones who would have to integrate into a new system for the reunification to succeed. 
Of course, if you know anything about North Koreans, you'll immediately know that drawing a parallel between them and East Germans is not exactly prudent. For the most part, East Germans were willing to embrace the culture and hope for a better economic future. North Koreans, on the other hand, will likely have trouble shedding authoritarianism and learning to navigate a society that values individual freedoms. And this isn't just an educated guess. North Korean defectors, or individuals who have escaped from North Korea and resettled in South Korea, have actually expressed dislike for democracy. According to a 2016 study on South and North Korean integration and North Korea's adaptability, but still, even with all the differences between Germany and Korea, some valuable lessons can be drawn from the German reunification experience and the potential Korean one. 1. The political, economic, and social power must be shifted away from the elites of the region being, quote, acquired for the reunification to work. Of course, this gets trickier on the Korean peninsula, considering that the country being hypothetically acquired, North Korea, is known for its highly centralized power structure and tightly controlled political environment. Or, to simply put it, North Korean elites and authorities aren't likely to give up their power willingly. This leaves a hostile takeover as the only viable solution, which could only be pulled off violence-free if the North Korean regime were to collapse. Another important lesson from the German reunification is that external factors seem to play an important role in the process. This is important for Korea, as a potential reunification will surely receive some strong reactions, given the geopolitical significance of the Korean peninsula. Of course, there's one aspect of the potential Korean reunification that raises the most serious concerns at a global level – nuclear weapons. A unified Korea would likely be a prominent nuclear power thanks to the many North Korean nuclear and missile programs. Though foreign countries might not have a deciding influence on Korean reunification, the newly formed country would likely need to make some sort of formal announcement on how it plans to deal with all these fear-inducing nuclear programs. The third and arguably most important lesson is that reunification is an economically and politically costly process that requires an immense amount of effort. But also, the same if not worse costs come with a failed reunification process. Beyond the lessons, this comparison to Germany is only of limited utility. Once you hear all the challenges standing in the way of a unified Korea, you'll immediately understand why. For starters, the relations between the Koreas are far more strained than those observed between West and East Germany. After all, there was never a German civil war. Plus, North Korea is significantly more isolated than East Germany ever was, primarily in an economic sense. But let's dive deeper into the challenges standing in the way of Korean reunification by looking at how a reunified Korea would look, be organized, and made to function effectively. Let's start with politics. Like we've already mentioned, and as you're probably well aware, the primary priority of North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un is safeguarding his dynastic regime. This means he isn't likely to accept a unification that's essentially stripping him of any powers, thus heralding the demise of said dynasty. So a 100% German-style unification is automatically out of the question. But what about South Korea? Would it be able to take on the role of East Germany instead and be, quote, acquired by North Korea? The answer is a resounding no. A democracy as vibrant and freewheeling as South Korea will surely resist submitting to a totalitarian regime that can do nothing but threaten its core values and principles. So, what's the solution for a unified Korea? Well, arguably, the only viable option would be the one country, two systems arrangement, a la China and Hong Kong. Of course, even this option might be a no-go for Kim, who sees even the slightest relaxation of central control as a potential threat to his regime's stability. Either way, that's what could potentially happen on the political front. But what about its geopolitical counterpart? One thing is for sure, the impact of a Korean reunification would stretch far beyond the Korean peninsula and its neighboring countries. First and foremost, this move would remove a buffer state from the Chinese border, altering regional dynamics. The move would surely also make Japan more attentive to the region, given its tense relationship with Korea throughout history. Beyond China and Japan, two more countries would be the most interested in seeing and affecting how a reunified Korea acts in terms of its foreign and security policies. The countries in question are the US and Russia. Before discussing their potential involvements, let's see how the delicate balance in East Asia's security architecture is currently achieved. In one corner we have South Korea and Japan, backed by the US as their biggest ally. On the other, there's North Korea with its fluctuating support coming from China and Russia. So to unify Korea, some type of balance would need to be achieved between all these major players. Unfortunately, the US 
and China and Russia and peace and balance are rarely ever seen in the same sentence. Arguably, the most contentious issue in this regard would be the U.S. military presence in Japan and South Korea. At present, the U.S. maintains over 50,000 troops in Japan and almost 30,000 in South Korea. The reason? The North Korean threat, of course. If a Korean reunification were to take place, these troops would surely undergo scrutiny and reconsideration. The world would likely wonder why the troops are still there if the peace has indeed been achieved. At the same time, China would probably consider leaving the troops stationed on the Korean Peninsula as an effort to put American troops on its border. So, how could a reunified Korea balance all these interests and concerns of major powers? The answer is simple. It couldn't. The only way a reunified Korea is to survive and prosper isn't by adopting a balanced policy toward major powers. It's by becoming a major power in its own right. To that end, let's see what the economic future holds for a reunified Korea. In other regards, there might be some questions about what side would dominate the policies of a unified Korea more. In the economic department, there is no question whatsoever. All you need to know is that South Korea's GDP is roughly $1.67 trillion, placing it in the top five biggest economies in Asia and the top 15 in the world. North Korea's GDP is less than 2% of that, around $28.5 billion. This naturally means that South Korea would take the brunt of economic influence in a unified Korea. But it also means that it would have to shoulder a greater burden of economic integration and development and potentially address the disparities between the two Koreas. And what a burden that could be! According to some estimates, Korean reunification could cost up to $10 trillion, which is six times South Korea's annual GDP. But interestingly, this staggering figure hasn't dissuaded South Korea from considering reunification. It only reinforces the notion that a potential reunification must be gradual, taking place over several decades. So what would happen during this lengthy period? Well, South Korea would implement economic incentives aiming to slowly increase the living standards in the North. The end goal is to raise these standards enough so that a full assimilation is possible. Another thing that would likely happen in a unified Korea is a, quote, attack of South Korea's family-owned conglomerates like Samsung, LG, and Hyundai on the North. These companies are already among the world's most powerful ones but could significantly expand their influence by taking advantage of the newly available cheap labor. To prevent the exploitation of Northerners who simply don't know better, implementing ethical labor practices and fair employment policies would become crucial. Similar considerations would need to be directed at property to prevent these conglomerates from sweeping in and snapping up assets to build factories. For the property to be protected, it would need to be largely privatized. Privatization is another process that requires a lot of time and patience. Just look at Germany, our model for reunification, where privatization is still underway to this day. But let's go back to the people for a second. Let's discuss how a potential Korean reunification would play out for them. First up, demographics. South Korea's fertility rate is the lowest in the world. Even worse, it has been since 2013. This alarming trend has resulted in a rapidly aging population that brings numerous economic, social, and security challenges. According to some estimates, South Korea will need a little over 15 million working-age people by 2060 to avoid contracting its labor force. And do you know how many working-age individuals North Korea has? Around 18 million. Well, isn't that convenient? This means that adding North Koreans to the equation and redistributing them across a unified Korea would potentially address the demographic challenges faced by South Korea. However, this would probably be only a temporary fix. You see, North Korea doesn't particularly excel in the birth rate and life expectancy departments. As a result, even if it merged with South Korea, the unified country's total population would still continue to stagnate by 2025. To make matters worse, it would probably start declining around 2035. So, for a reunified Korea to truly prosper, these population challenges should take center stage during the planning stage for the possible contingencies of reunification. Same goes for the potential health repercussions of this unification. You see, nearly all of North Korea's 26 million inhabitants lack basic health care. This has allowed infectious diseases like hepatitis B, tuberculosis, and parasitic worms to run rampant, posing severe health challenges to the well-being of the unified population. Unfortunately, the physical health of the Korean inhabitants isn't the only thing to consider. Their mental health is another huge concern. In this regard, we primarily refer to North Koreans. Why? Well, for starters, these people only know a lifestyle where virtually everything is chosen for them. This might make their newfound freedom more taxing than liberating, transforming even simple choices into Herculean tasks. 
For instance, Dae Young Ho, the former North Korean deputy ambassador to the United Kingdom, says he still struggles with things like what to order off a menu or which bank to use. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. After all, South Korea is one of the most fast-paced countries in the world, with a loud personality that spawned global phenomena like K-pop and K-dramas. All of this can be overwhelming and disorienting for North Koreans accustomed to a highly controlled and limited lifestyle. But another arguably more concerning angle is the treatment of Northerners by the Southerners. If current North Korean defectors are to serve as any indication, the prospects of a joint life in a unified Korea look bleak. These defectors report that they often face discrimination, resulting in a struggle to find jobs and make a decent living. For some, it gets so bad that they decide to return to North Korea. That takes us back to the notion that a reunified Korea would have first-class citizens, the South Koreans, and second-class citizens, the North Koreans. Of course, this could potentially be avoided or at least reduced through massive affirmative action programs aiming to bridge the socioeconomic and cultural gaps between the North and South. Given how much the South desires reunification, these programs might just work. Still, there's always the possibility for North Koreans with access to weapons to resort to petty crimes to get financially ahead instead of relying on affirmative action programs to help them. This brings us to the final challenge of Korean reunification, security. But addressing these and similar crimes will be the least of a unified Korea's worries. The bigger issue is what to do with North Korea's military and nuclear power. If we go back to Germany's example, this element posed no issues. East Germany's military was dissolved, with most of the 175,000 soldiers leaving the force altogether. Those who stayed simply swapped their uniform for a German Bundeswehr one. In the Korean Peninsula, things aren't so simple. Demilitarizing North Korea would hardly go as smoothly. After all, we're talking about an army with over 1.3 million troops, 1,300 aircraft, 4,300 tanks, 5,500 multiple rocket launchers. This endeavor would undoubtedly consume the government of the unified Korea and still possibly require international help. That's not to mention all the nuclear weapons North Korea possesses. East Germany had no nuclear weapons of its own, only those housed by the Soviet Union. North Korea, however, has up to 60 nuclear bombs and up to 5,000 tons of chemical and biological weapons stored in over 10,000 underground facilities and labyrinths across the country. Besides finding a way to demilitarize the country and seize assets without them being sold off, the primary goal would be to address the number of nuclear and missile scientists. If a unified Korea were denuclearized, they would find themselves out of work but with a skill that can earn them a lot of money elsewhere. After all, there are reports that North Korea's own missile program was built by recruited Soviet scientists, so what would stop them from doing the same for a criminal or terrorist group? The aspect of Korean reunification would probably require the most intermediation of outside powers. So there you have it. These are the most prominent challenges a reunified Korea would face and what resolving them could potentially look like. But we still have one more question to answer. Is reunification possible considering everything standing in its way? Most experts agree it isn't possible in the near term. So let's break down why. In the first scenario, the North Korean regime would have to collapse on its own. The second scenario concerns a slow, gradual, and most importantly consensual process that would take place over years, if not decades. And the third scenario would involve a full-blown war. At the moment, all of these options appear unlikely. The countries are back on somewhat hostile terms, eliminating scenario one, then again they aren't so hostile to warrant a war to break out, though let's face it, you never can know considering Kim's volatile personality. As for the second scenario, we must sadly report that the North Korean regime appears as resilient as ever. Given the firm grip North Korean leadership maintains on power, it shouldn't be surprising that there are no major internal factors that could contribute to its collapse. But even with its military might and aggressive posturing, North Korea is still and will probably always be on an unsustainable path. That's why this scenario remains the most appealing for a stable, reunified Korea. Of course, as we've already mentioned, the gradual process from Scenario 2 would also play a crucial role, as lots and lots of time and effort is the only way to pull off an endeavor as colossal as Korean reunification. What do you think? Is Korean reunification possible? And if so, which scenario is the most likely? Do you believe that North Korea is on borrowed time, or will its regime be able to withstand everything that might come its way? Share your predictions in the comments section below. Now go ahead and check out this video, or maybe this one instead.